Welcome to MBF Biosciences Stereology Q&A session as part of the SFN Global Connectome. Uh, my name is Nathan Elise. I'm the uh, product manager of Stereo Investigator. I'm joined here today by uh, Dr. Dan Peruzzi. Peruzzi. Um, Dan has been at MBF. Um, Dan and I have worked together at MBF for the last about 16 years. Um, he's our in-house stereology expert. Um, Dan's been using MBF software since uh, the late 1980s, so he, he really knows his way around. Um, he also curates stereology.info, and that's a resource that, that we have available and we'll be showing uh, bits and pieces of today. And he also heads up our uh, tech support department. Good morning, Dan. How's it going? Morning, Nate. Um, we're also lucky enough today to be joined by Dr. Daniel Peterson. Uh, Dr. Peterson is a longtime customer. He's a world-renowned neuroscientist and stereology expert. Um, we've worked with he and his lab for years, uh, and they've been very influential in shaping Staring Investigator, um, and we've just had a really great working relationship with them. So welcome, Dan. Thank you so much for joining us. Morning. Glad to be with you. And so, as I said, uh, this is a stereology Q&A session. We're going to uh, cover a few things first, um, but one of the things I want to touch on um, first is to uh, how to submit a question, because uh, we definitely want to hear from everybody. Um, so everyone should have a GoToWebinar uh, panel. You should have an orange arrow here. You can click on that, and you'll see a question area. You can type your question in here and then click on the Send button. And uh, we'll see your questions. We're going to field as many of those as possible today. Um, so please send those in. If we're not able to get to everything, we'll try to reach out um, to folks afterwards because uh, we definitely want to hear from folks and and uh, and help you out as much as we can. Um, also, this is going to be recorded, so we will uh, have this available on our YouTube channel. Uh, our other presentations as part of the SFN Global Connectome will be there as well. Uh, so please check that out, uh, or if you want to refer somebody to that that wasn't able to attend, uh, please feel free to do that. Uh, Dan, what do you say we uh, get started? Okay, uh, welcome everyone. And I know the reason everyone is here today is so that we can talk about stereology. Stereology is the scientific study of shapes, uh, but what we want to perform is unbiased stereology. And what that means is getting estimates of number, length, surface and volume uh, in a way where we don't make mistakes. For example, we don't F overestimate the number of cells would be one example. Um, so we want to perform unbiased stereology. Now stereology is not um, limited to the field of science or neuroscience. Uh, in fact, uh, its early use was uh, in uh, geology. But the reason that we're gathered here today is because we want to get uh, data, we want to get estimates of number, length, surface, and volume from images that were gathered with a microscope. Uh, so Nate's going to describe kind of a system, a typical system that might be used for this. So as Dan said, we uh, integrate with a microscope, and the software really kind of brings everything together and coordinates all the communications between the uh, pieces of hardware. So we've got a motorized stage, uh, and that's really critical for the, the systematic random sampling. We'll kind of talk about that later. And we've got the stage controller, and then the joystick, which is another way to move that stage. Um, this, this system is set up with two cameras, so you can image both bright field and fluorescence on this system. So we've got two cameras. And then the system also has um, an apatome, which is a structured illumination device, which will provide uh, confocal-like images. Over on the right, we have a video that just goes through turning each individual component on. That's something that you know you kind of do a good 30 seconds before you start up the software. It gives a chance, uh, gives all the hardware a chance to kind of initialize, but it's just kind of neat to see all the different components that make up a system. Thank you, Nate. Okay, so uh, the purpose of today's uh, meeting is not to learn how to do these probes from beginning to end. Uh, that's something that we can help you with one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, Stereology.info is a great place to look uh, for how to perform these probes. Uh, but this is, uh, this is a social, and we want to let your questions uh, drive and uh, drive uh, our interactions. And uh, the topic for today is kind of what, what does unbiased stereology, uh, um, what is the advantage of using it? And another way of saying that is what are the uh, mistakes or the biases 
that can creep into your sampling and your data? And how, how are those avoided when we use these unbiased stereology probes? So before we get to the question and answer uh, session, I do want to uh, just give a little overview of what types of data can be uh, estimated and what are the uh, most popular and best probes to use. Again, we won't be going through um, how to do the whole probe, but instead we'll be talking about how to avoid biases when we use the probes. So this slide at the bottom, we have uh, scenes from everyday life to show volume or surface area or length or number on the gross level, just to help us uh, identify what we're talking about. But of course, we are uh, estimating volume, surface area, length, and number from what we see under the microscope. And the way this works is we're going to, uh, you always want to use systematic random sampling. And uh, that's actually going to be one of the topics we could talk about that we could take your questions about systematic random sampling. We use systematic random sampling, and depending on what we're looking for, volume, surface, length, or number, the program Stereo Investigator will generate virtual shapes. The shapes get put down in the tissue, and our job is to mark the interaction of the shapes with the tissue. And those are called countable events. So right here, we're showing uh, that you can estimate volume by using points. You can use points to estimate the area of this cross section. And once you get all the areas of the cross sections, th uh, that can be put together to estimate a volume. So to estimate volume, we can use points. To estimate the surface of a membrane, this might be, for instance, the respiratory membrane in the lung or the fetal maternal membrane in the placenta. To estimate its surface area, the program stereo investigator uh, will generate virtual lines, and our job is to count the intersections of the lines with the surface whose surface area we're trying to estimate. The more intersections there are, the more surface there is, and uh, the, these events get put into a formula to estimate volume or surface. As we move over, we see that we can also estimate length. This, this could be a blood vessel or an axon. Uh, processes, any type of biological string. If you want to estimate the length, we count the intersections of a surface, this plane right here, with the blood vessels, for instance. Again, the more intersections there are, the more length of uh, the biological string there is. Now, this is probably uh, what a lot of people are interested in estimating the number of cells. For that, we need a three-dimensional situation. We can't have just one thin section because we have to compare at least two sections to find the, the leading edge or the top of the cells. So we count cell tops inside of this dissector, a three-dimensional situation. So we can use points to estimate volume, lines to estimate surface, uh, planes to estimate length, and we need a three-dimensional situation to estimate number. Let's look at the names of these uh, probes that are used to do this estimation. To estimate cell population, uh, an example might be total number of uh, dorsal horn neurons in the spinal cord. Uh, there's a probe called the optical fractionator, and that will use a three-dimensional space, and our job will be to find the tops of the cells in that three-dimensional space Systematic random sampling is used, and then there's a formula that extrapolates out so that you can get an estimate of the number of cells in the whole region that you're concerned with. There's a probe called the nucleator that can be turned on during the optical fractionator to estimate the volume of cells. If you want to estimate regional volume, the best probe to use for that is called capillary point counting. That's this one where we're using points to estimate volume. If you want to estimate surface area, the isotropic fakir is a triplet of lines, uh, all orthogonal to each other, such that it's an isotropic probe. And to estimate fiber length, there's a probe called space balls. So in that case, we don't use a plane, we use a sphere, which is an infinite number of planes isotropically arranged. 
So these are the uh, main probes that we recommend for people to use. Uh, they're modern probes. They're the easiest ones to use. Optical fractionator to estimate number. Cavillary point counting to estimate volume. Isotropic fakir to estimate surface. And space balls to estimate fiber length. Those are all regional probes. Here's an example of a local probe that can be turned on during the optical fractionator so that you will get an estimate of number and also an estimate of the volume of, of those individual cells. So as I've been saying, uh, we are not going to go through from soup to nuts how to perform these stereological probes, optical fractionator, capillary point counting, isotropic fakir, and space balls. Instead, what we want to do is highlight kind of why are we using these probes? What are these probes buying us? How do these probes avoid bias? And what can go wrong when you, uh, for instance, don't follow the rules of the probe? So we have these, um, these ways that bias uh, can creep into your data, broken up into two categories, where you look and how you look. So we want to be following the rules of the probe I'd like you guys to uh, think of questions about um, these types of uh, rules we have to follow. For instance, uh, one, uh, the optical fractionator, we have to follow uh, certain rules. One thing we have to do is we can't do that at low power. We have to do it at high power with an oil lens. So if people have questions about that, uh, send them to us. Also, we want to use systematic random sampling if you've been having trouble with that, or maybe you have human tissue and you have to, and you can't do it. Um, let's talk about that. We want to be able to use the whole region. And we, um, there's also a concern about maintaining isotropy. And uh, this is when we're estimating surface or estimating length or estimating the volume of particles then we really have to think about what probe we're using uh, so that every, um, uh, so that we don't favor any combination of the probe and the tissue so, so that we would uh, uh, let bias happen. So um, that is a little bit of a, um, a very quick summary of what you can estimate, estimate and what the probes are that are used. We always wanna use systematic random sampling. While you're thinking of your questions, I am going to uh, turn this over to Dan Peterson, who's going to talk about his um, stereology course, which uh, concentrates on confocal images. I've taken this course uh, several times, and I highly recommend it. Uh, please go ahead, Dan. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Dan. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today and be able to uh, participate in this forum. I look forward to discussion with the participants about their various questions. <clears throat> um, I'd like to just take a moment to tell you about a workshop that I run, which is a combination, as you can see from the title on the right, it's an international workshop in both confocal microscopy and stereology. And so I've been doing this since 2003. Um, we started in Chicago back in the old days, of course, when we could do things in person. This turned into a week-long sort of boot camp, much like you would have with a Woods Hole or a Cold Spring Harbor course. And we would have everyone in there. We would go through the theory. We would do practical sessions and tutorials. We had a variety of equipment to work on, and then people would bring their samples. And that's been going on for years, and you know, uh, hundreds of, of students and faculty and technicians have taken this um, and it's a quick start on your research approach and we really you know try to help you get a good approach to doing the stereology and also the imaging and specimen preparation which underlies what you're going to count that's actually very important too now with COVID-19 of course this has altered things so last August we did our first virtual workshop and you can see the schedule here on the right uh, we limited it to four and a half hours a day, which is as much time as anyone can stay on a Zoom interaction. Um, so we're covering the same topics, and it's just been adapted, and I have some, some canned videos I walk through to help deal with the fact that we're not physically handling the equipment. Uh, you can see on the schedule there on the right, 
the content, we start with sample preparation, we go through the imaging approaches, and then we focus on the principles of design-based stereology, uh, going to a deep dive of the things that, that Dan just introduced. And then uh, the very last day, it's a very practical one. How do you do these things? How do you implement them? And uh, we cover everything from traditional bright field all the way through clear tissue. We do discuss electron microscopy to some degree, but it's all types of preparations that lead to this. Uh, our next one is going to be from February 1st to 5th. And <clears throat> um, I just have, if you could advance the next slide, please, for me, Dan. Um, I just have a little bit of information that you might find helpful. And so we had a, a survey monkey. And at the beginning, we asked the people, as you see on the left, what was your level of understanding of confocal microscopy at the beginning of the workshop? And you see it varies. And we asked people, what was your understanding of stereology on the right-hand panel? And you can see that that also varied. There were some people who really felt they knew very little about that. So uh, if you go to the next slide. Yeah, so we asked them at the end of the course, okay, based on where you came in and what we covered, how did you, you find this? How was the relevance, first of all, on the left-hand side? And it looks like we were able to do a fairly good job at meeting what people wanted. Um, and on the right-hand panel, uh, we asked about, you know, now, now have you increased your understanding? Is this going to give you more ability to pursue your research? And um, again, you know, people felt that that was good. So those of you who may have a little concern about, um, if you go to the next slide, please, uh, for me, Dan. Uh, those of you who may have a little concern about, you know, how useful is a virtual one, um, I'd like to, you know, draw this to your attention. And you can see if you go to our website, neurorenew.com, uh, you can find all the information about content and pricing and to register. And we're extending the early bird registration to January 14th to allow participants of this workshop to be able to get that better rate. Uh, but I'm here actually to talk about your questions and to uh, help support uh, Dan Peruzzi in this. So I'm gonna turn it back over to, to Dan and, and let him get the ball rolling on this. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I don't want to miss a chance to thank you for all the teaching you've done over the years. And like I say, I've um, attended the courses and got a lot out of them. So thank you for that, for kind of spreading the word of unbiased stereology. Okay, so we are thinking about questions about how to remain biased concerning these different probes. I do see one question uh, here now. Uh, it says, I've used the capillary volume estimator to estimate the volume of regions in the brain. Uh, and what, uh, what Katarina is doing is using the area fraction fractionator. So this is a type of point counting. It's, uh, we actually don't have it labeled here. Uh, it is a type of point counting, same as Cavallari, but instead of uh, um, estimating a whole contiguous uh, region, area fraction fractionator is to estimate um, the percentage of different phases of the tissue. And so if you can get a reference volume, and um, what I want to do is go over to stereology.info to talk about this. So this is our uh, website, stereology.info, stereology.info. Uh, I do a lot of work to maintain this site. There's two ways to search on this site. If you know the name of the probe, you can go to the probe index. And if you're interested in probes that deal with regions, for instance, optical fractionator, uh, to estimate number of cells, you can uh, click here and find out about the optical fractionator. We also have space balls for volume, isotropic fakir for uh, surface, and capillary point counting uh, for volume. Sorry, space balls is for length. Uh, and right here, particles, uh, we can estimate data about particles and by far the most popular probe that people are using is the nucleator to estimate the volume of cells. More likely, you might not know the name of the probe, but you, but you know what your, what your hypothesis or idea is and what type of data you need to get to, um, uh, to find out about that idea. Uh, so for that, we click on what are you estimating. 
And we have this broken up into first order and second order stereology. First order deals with the cardinal properties of the tissue. Again, I'll just reiterate this number, length, surface and volume. Second order has to do with the relationship uh, among particles or cells. Um, so the question uh, was about the area of fraction fractionator. So we could click on volume or cross-sectional area and we will see this chart here. And this chart um, helps us decide for one thing, do we need thick or thin sections? Uh, and, and to estimate volume, we can use thin sections. The other thing we have to ask ourselves is, can we use any orientation of the tissue? Um, or does it have to be, uh, does the tissue has to be, have to be made isotropic by being randomly rotated? And in this case, uh, we can use any orientation of the tissue. This gives an idea of what capillary point counting is like, uh, where we put points down to estimate a whole volume. This is the area of fraction fractionator, and the idea here is um, if you get a reference volume, so let's just talk about uh, different ways to sample. Uh, we look under sampling, and there's two ways uh, that these probes can be done, either fractionator method or NV VREF method. All of the probes uh, that are listed, that we have listed today, um, space balls, isotropic flacare, and um, uh, capillary point counting, and optical fractionator. It, you even the, the word fractionator is built into the name of that probe, optical fractionator. A fractionator probe works by having us sample a fraction of the tissue, a percent of the tissue, and when we're done with, uh, when we're done sampling, uh, we extrapolate uh, to get, we extrapolate out to the tissue that we didn't look at to get the um, estimate. Uh, what Katarina's question has to do with is she's using area fraction fractionator, um, and that's where you do you put one kind of uh, like a triangle, one kind of marker down on on one type of tissue and another type of marker down on another type of tissue. And this will give you the percentage by volume of that type of tissue. Then you would have need to have obtained a reference volume. That can be done different ways. If it's a whole organ, people can use water displacement. Um, if it is something inside of the organ, uh, you can use capillary point counting to get your reference volume. So the area of fraction fractionator will give you percent by volume of the different phases of your tissue, and you multiply that by the reference volume, and that gives you um, uh, the, uh, the, um, the volume of all the different phases of the tissue. Um, so that, that's the one case where um, we do recommend using this NVV ref method is when you're doing the area of fraction fractionator, if you want to get a quick look at what the area fraction fractionator would look like, uh, in this case, uh, this is to estimate volume of, of uh, it, it, it's plaque load. Uh, so for, say, Alzheimer's, we have, we have plaque in the uh, cortex. We, it would be hard to go through and outline and to you know trace each one of these plaques it's even kind of difficult to see where the border is um, and it's considered a biased process uh, to trace now if you can do a good job tracing that doesn't mean it's a bad process but uh, but what's going on here is we use systematic random sampling and at at the counting site our job is to put a yellow X everywhere we see plaque in a different um, um, and then we'll get a percent by volume of plaque. And if we had a, a reference volume of the cortex, we could multiply that percent by the reference volume uh, to get the uh, volume uh, of that phase of tissue. Dan, if I could uh, maybe jump in and add something here. Yes, please. I, I think what, uh, you know, sort of from a, a big picture view, asking the right question is really important. And I think you've illustrated that great here with the, the plaque load. You know, you can count plaques or you can say how much plaque there is. 
And that's really the better question is the, the second one, how much, how much plaque load is there? I was talking with someone the other day <clears throat> about mitochondria, changes in mitochondrial volume, and they thought they should count mitochondria. Well, you, you could, but mitochondria are not like in the textbooks. They're very branching, elaborate things. Uh, they move around. Um, and so in a sense, the better thing to know there is, is there a change in the volume of the mitochondria or maybe the surface area of the Christie? So um, when, you, when you're approaching your question to apply stereology, give a little thought to what is the, the right parameter. What's gonna tell you something and volume tells you a lot. Um, you know, changes in nuclear volume could be useful in grading gliomas, for instance. Um, so these are great tools. They're easily implemented. Um, volume's kind of almost like a free bit of data you can always get in any study. So it's, it's well worth considering. Thank you, Dan. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna keep going through these questions here. Uh, one question is, can we do stereology on Neurolucida? The answer to that is no. Neurolucida is another program. It's used for tracing, uh, tracing neurons and reconstructing serial sections. Uh, to do st unbiased stereology, uh, you'll need the program Stereo Investigator. Let's see, I have a, uh, we have a question. Uh, what are your views on the proportionator method of area sampling? I think, uh, I think that Michael may be referring to a method where you try to look, um, when you do your sampling, you try to weight it more towards the, um, you want to do more sampling where the uh, where the for instance where the plaque actually is. Uh, we don't implement that particular uh, process in our uh, in our program. I haven't actually seen any papers published on it. Uh, Michael, if you do have uh, know of a paper published on that, I'd be glad to see that. Uh, so I, I'm just not really um, qualified to uh, comment on if that's useful or not, uh, but I would like to learn more about it. Yeah, there might be a reference to sort of taking populations as a whole and kind of essentially putting them in a blender and then sorting them out using, you know, sort of like a, um, a mass approach. And uh, people like to do this with flow and so forth, uh, flow yeah. cytometry. Um, I believe that one, that one was called the homogeneous uh, fractionator or something like that. For so what everything you're looking for as a yeah and so, so the point the point there is um it, it's easier to sample if the cells or whatever the data is the uh, fibers um or the surfaces are are not clumped if they're not heterogeneous but they're homogeneous then you can do less sampling and just extrapolate out to um regions that are similar uh, uh so people um so if you actually homogenize the tissue and suspend it and then take aliquots while it is completely homogeneous, then you don't have to do much sampling. But of course the problem, uh, or I don't know if it's a problem, but it's part of the experimental design there is you lose all of your anatomy. Is that the, that's the one I think you were talking about right there? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Okay, um, Okay. so here's a question. How about the, how about the local volume of the plaques? So what I, what I described is uh, putting markers down and uh, getting percent by volume of plaque and then, and then multiplying that ratio by the reference volume of the whole cortex or whatever region of the cortex you're looking at. But this question is asking how, um, you know, that, that will give you uh, the volume of all the plaque, but what about the individual uh, pieces of plaque? Uh, let's see, and I'm curious about your, uh, let's see. How about local volume of the plaques? They're interesting because they don't have a clear center that you could use for the nucleator. So the nucleator is a probe that you can use to estimate area or volume of particles. So if we want to get a quick look at the nucleator, we can go to the probe index and go to particle. 
and nucleator. And this gives you like a, a quick snapshot of the probe in action. So the nucleator uh, runs on top of the optical fractionator. So this is the thickness of the section. And we use systematic random sampling. We go to the first conning site, and you'll see a dissector, which has a red sides and two green sides. And we want to restrict ourselves to conning cells only in that dissector. By the way, you have to do this at high power with an oil lens so that you will have many uh, many planes through the cell. Uh, right now we're looking at like the equator of a cell. We can focus up and down. This is what I mean by many planes through the cell. This way we can find the top of the cell and put a mark on it. So we put a red mark on the top of the cell. So th those are the rules and uh, th that's one thing I wanted to talk about today is um, the rules of the optical fractionator which are do it at high power. Um, Focus up and down until you find the top of the cell. So now this cell will be counted as, uh, in the optical fractionator. And now we can turn on the nucleator probe. And for the nucleator, we, we know we're going to use this cell because it's been picked for the optical fractionator. Its top, that red dot, is in the dissector. So that means that this cell gets counted and it also gets used for the local probe, which is the nucleator. And the way that works is you want to put a mark on the nucleolus. If you can't see a nucleolus, you just put it at some random place in the middle of the cell. Once you put that mark down, rays will be uh, shot out. So there's two yellow rays. And the way this works is we take the mean of those two rays. That's the radius uh, for the formula four thirds pi r cubed. Uh, so it's uh, we're, we're taking we're taking a estimated radius and putting it putting it in the formula for a sphere, and that gives us an estimate of the volume of the sphere. Uh, we can also put it in the formula for the area of a circle, and get an estimate of the area. So that is what um, Michael is talking about when he's asking. Uh, let's see. Let's go back to the plaque one. And I might add that's that's what's really important for using systematic random sampling because if you are interested in how big your plaques are and you're just going and selecting plaques to measure, there's going to be a bias, a sampling bias to picking the bigger ones. And so if you want to really have a rigorous approach, you would use the systematic random sampling so you're measuring what you really encounter in a correct probabilistic way rather than kind of picking the big ones to measure. So then the question there, Dan, I think is, is are your pieces of plaque similar enough to a particle where you can actually find a leading edge of it? Um, if, if they were, then you could certainly use um, uh, the optical fractionator and treat these plaque pieces as particles. Uh, and like you said, use a systematic random sampling, only look at plaque volumes, little plaque volumes whose tops are in the dissector, uh, and then you could use the nucleator on it. I guess another thing, another way you could approach this would be to put your points closer together and um, get individual, um, it, maybe you could get a couple different focal planes through this plaque, uh, and then uh, just do a cavallari on the individual plaques. I don't know, uh, that's just kind of off the top of my head. Yeah, that, that would work, but you would um, you would still need to pick them in an unbiased fashion. So it'd have to be paired with an optical fractionator approach. And then you yeah. have to have really high resolution series through in terms of optical depth of field to make an anywhere near an accurate estimate. If they really were flat, maybe you could um, try to imagine the center of the plaque, and if the center of the plaque was in the counting frame, then count the flag, plaque, or maybe use the upper left corner of the plaque. Find some way to um, pick these pieces of plaque without picking the bigger ones more often. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you, Dan. Uh, and, by the way, um, before the nucleator, they used to do point counting on cells, 
uh, but it's hard to get many planes through a cell and sometimes it's hard to see exactly where the plasma membrane is and that's why nuclear was invented. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so let's keep going through these questions. Thanks for your questions. Okay, good. Uh, it, we've got a, a paper with Nyngard and Gunderson on the proportionator. I will read that. Uh, oh, and look, uh, Michael wrote, before I even said it, you would still need to find the center of the plaque, though, right? Wouldn't you need super thick optical dissectors? Um, so... I don't, um, that would depend on how much Z component the plaque, how flat it is. Um, if it is, um, and this kind of reminds me of people uh, sometimes estimate things that are bigger than cells, like islets of Langerhan or um, uh, in the kidney, the um, uh, glomeruli. And what you can do is if you're, uh, if the object that you're trying to estimate the number of is much bigger than a cell, you know, glomeruli is made up of hundreds or I don't know, thousands maybe of cells, um, you can use a probe called the physical fractionator instead of the optical fractionator. So like every probe uh, that we want to find out about, we can come up here to probe index and go to region and look at, uh, instead of optical fractionator, we're going to look at physical fractionator. Physical fractionator is kind of a digital version of the optical fractionator. You can think of optical fractionator as an analog version because you are focusing through a thick section looking for the top of a cell. But in this case, we might be talking about a very big plaque or a glomeruli or an islet. Uh, and we're just not going to be able to get uh, tish, uh, sections that are thick enough where we're going to be likely to see the leading edge of that uh, very big, I don't even know whether to call it a particle or not, the, uh, the very big plaque or glomeruli. So you could use the physical fractionator. And uh, what the physical fractionator does is it, you take two thin sections rather than one thick section. If you know that your plaque, uh, pieces of plaque are something like, uh, I don't know, 500 microns or 400 microns in Z, then you would space your reference and your lookup images um, about 250 microns apart from each other. Uh, and then you would compare, now this, this is showing uh, in the lung, we have an alveoli that is whole, and then we have an alveoli that has a, um, it has a break in it. And that's, that's that's a special case when you're counting air sacs uh, to look for this break. Um, if we were counting, say, these pieces of plaque, then we would look for one thin section that had the plaque in it and the next thin section that does not have the plaque in it. Uh, in the kidney, there's something called the double dissector where people will use, take thick sections and use those to count the cells that make up the glomeruli or whatever other cells they want, maybe duct cells or something. And, and then they will take thin optical sections through that physical section so that they can also count glomeruli. Um, so that, uh, that was a good, uh, good comment, uh, Michael, about um, how are we going to find the leading edge of the plaque when you need super thick optical dissectors? And the question is, yeah, sometimes it gets too thick. And in that case, switch to the physical fractionator. Yeah, I might just jump in with a historical perspective here, too. Um, if you go back to the days when I was a graduate student, you had everything done with a 2D approach. And it was done on thin sections. And that was the heritage. That's how we always produce things. There's usually thin paraffin sections. Um, the revolution came with the design-based probes. So instead of trying to um, wrap your head around, okay, a cell is a sphere, or you know, a mitochondria is an ellipsoidal rotation, or some geometric model, your probe was the geometric model. And that's where was born this concept of a dissector probe where you had a physical offset. And so for thin sections or macro sections like these big slabs, 
where you're looking perhaps at glomeruli through the kidney. Um, this is um, a great approach to use either that classic physical dissector, but put into a fractionator design. So it becomes the physical fractionator um, that was just being referred to by Dan. But a much more efficient approach for most of the things you want to do in neuroscience is to use these new design-based probes. They have all the value of being uh, of removing the bias. And the only thing you have to consider is you need thick enough tissue to do it because you have to digitally insert this three-dimensional probe into your tissue. Here's an, exa thick here's an tissue. example. Yeah. Here's an example of a probe being inserted into the tissue. Yeah. So thick enough tissue and also good enough optical resolution, which means you really have to use an oil lens. You, you just can't get by using a, a, a dry lens in most circumstances. And I could talk about those caveats where you could do it separately, but in a general principle, you want to use an oil lens. Hey guys, I'd love to jump in and ask a question about that because it's something that Dan Peruzzi has mentioned as well. Um, I feel like a lot of folks say, you know, I can see the cells. Um, why can't I just count them at low power? Why do I have to mess with, you know, getting oil on and all this kind of stuff? And, you know, it gets everywhere and I got to clean my objective. Why can't I just count at like 20 or, or even 40 air? Why, why do you need that, that resolution? So the reason is, and so I, I read a lot of um, uh, unbiased stereology papers, especially when people are estimating number of cells using the optical fractionator. And the biggest mistake people are making is they're doing it at low power. So if you don't go to high power and find the top of the cell, you can't guarantee that what you're looking at is a whole cell. So if you're at say times 10 or times 20 and you're looking at all these little dots, you don't know if those are half cells or third of cells. Um, for a while, I remember when uh, Journal of Comparative Neurology uh, started insisting that model-based stereology was used instead of these design-based probes where we anticipate the bias and, and the probes are designed to eliminate the bias ahead of time. Uh, what, what the journals were doing before design-based stereology uh, started being used was asking people to crank their data through a formula, one of them is called the Abercrombie formula, so that it would change the number of cell pieces to the number of cells. But that is really problematic to get the right information for that formula, and it's much better to go into the sampling with your eyes open and use a probe. So specifically there, rather than counting cell pieces at low power where you're going to overestimate, instead go to high power and find the tops of the cells and take a lot of pain are a lot of um, a lot of care to make sure that the cells you count are in this dissector, which is a known volume fraction, and then we can es then we can uh, we can extrapolate to estimate. Dan, do we have a slide that illustrates kind of the the trap that you can fall into when you're counting cell pieces as opposed to cell tops? I want to say uh, we did, right? Yeah. Let Let me go back over to our slide. Yeah. Well, he's finding that I can give you a rule of thumb you basically need to have something that can discriminate at the level of one or two microns for counting cells so that you can count if you think of an average cell of being you know anywhere between 10 and 20 microns in diameter you can have a number of focal planes through five ten focal planes through the cell you kind of need that to be able to count tops of cells and discriminate cells that meet the inclusion and exclusion criteria and that's that's called the axial resolution. That is the in the focal plane as opposed to the lateral resolution. And that's why the axial resolution that, that Dan's gonna talk about here, I think, is, is so critical for getting, being able to properly implement these tools. Yeah, here's a, a diagram of that. Here's a 10 times objective with a numerical aperture of 0.25. Uh, it's gonna have, um, uh, a wide swath of axial resolution. In other words, if we're looking at these three different size cells, we can't even tell that there are three cells there. We just see this one big cell dominating everything. That's why in order to identify the leading edge of a cell, 
we have to use a oil lens. This one is 100 times 1.25 uh, numerical aperture. That has to do with how this is designed and the fact that you're using oil. It can get a much thinner swath of what's in focus. Uh, what Dan is saying, the name for that is axial resolution. And we need to be able to optically shave off the top of the cell so we can tell if the cell top is in the dissector or not. The reason we look at only the top is because we don't want uh, we don't want bias to creep in because big cells will be um, different than small cells. So we look at just their tops, which will be closer to each other uh, than the whole cell. We, uh, we want to have a thin axial resolution so that we can have many planes of focus through our dissector so we can focus up and down through the dissector uh, like we showed in that movie, uh, finding the top of the cell. Um, so, and this is a topic that we definitely wanted to hit and see if you had questions about, um, do the optical fractionator at high power with an oil lens, so you have thin uh, sections, um, and that is, that is a mistake uh, that is, uh, I, I'd like to kind of spread the word uh, that in order to see the top of the cell, you have to have an oil lens. There was one other thing that kind of, I don't know, I feel like uh, has come up when we've discussed this in the past. It's that we wanted to give the cell a chance to be counted once, right? Like that's all cells a chance to be counted once and only once. It's kind of the overarching theme. Yes, that's right. And, and, and by... Um, by restricting yourself to counting only those cells whose tops are in the dissector, you won't be double counting cells. So uh, that is the main reason for doing this, so that every cell gets counted once and only once. Um, this shows uh, the kind of the perils of, of not finding the top of the cell, but instead just seeing if a piece of the cell is in your section. Um, this shows that there are one, two, three, four, five um, profiles that you're going to see as you focus up and down. Um, but for unbiased stereology, we would only want to count this cell and this cell. We would be overcounting if we counted these other cells because they would be caught in, in a different um, um, dissector. So you can't do estimating number uh, in just one thin section. You have to have either two contiguous thin sections. That's called the physical fractionator. Uh, we recommend that for objects that are much bigger than cells or uh, what you really want to be using is the optical fractionator to estimate uh, uh, and, and for that you're going to need thick sections and that means about 30 microns after shrinkage. Yeah, thanks for bringing that topic up, Nate. Um, yeah, this, uh, this slide also shows uh, the great value of counting the tops of cells of using this approach um, because you will sample larger cells with higher probability otherwise. Like if you're counting neurons in glia, you'll count more neurons in glia because glia are smaller. Um, so you'll, you'll have a skewed estimate. Uh, sort of an example I use is if you put all these, think of these as balloons, and you put them all in a box in the middle of the room, so you got a mixture of small balloons and big balloons, equal number, let's say. And then you take a dart and you throw into the box. What's the likelihood you're going to pop a bigger balloon than a smaller balloon? Well, it's a higher probability from that single uh, event like that. So you have to have these devices to prevent you from being biased to larger things. And if you follow the, the approaches for SR systematic random sampling, you're going to get there, and using this virtual probe, you will you will get a good result. Can we bring your balloon and dart analogy a little farther? If every balloon had all, uh, was protected from the dart except on its very top, and then you threw the dart, it would be an equal chance for the big ones and the small ones to be popped. Yep, exactly. We're, we're dwindling the volume of these particles down as much as we can, uh, so that they are. Uh, are comparable to each other. Okay. Is it safe to say that, that most folks doing stereology um, 
no nobody really intends to introduce bias is kind of like it just kind of creeps in due to you know factors that may or may not be outside their control or just something that, that maybe they didn't realize was happening yeah the history of how things have been done in their field just kind of like that that gut feeling you were talking about before like i'm at low power i can see these cells i'm just going to count them maybe without realizing they may be half cells or third cells um yeah yeah um all okay. right let's there's it looks like we got another question um with the space ball probe also do we need the 100x lens or can counting be done with 40x uh before i answer that one there's oh, sorry, also yeah. No, that's good. Uh, but there's one about can it, can we use 40 time lens for cell counting? So the question is when doing the um, optical fractionator and you have this dissector and you need to focus through it uh, with multiple focal planes, will a 40 times objective be good enough for that? 40 times air, probably not. 40 times oil, probably yes. You can figure this out empirically though by uh, focusing through the cells and seeing if you have at least you know several focal planes through one cell so that you can uh, find the top of the cell. I might uh, add there too that the the 40x refers to the lateral magnification so you can have many different 40x lenses and, and the, the point Dan just made is that it's the numerical aperture that NA number it needs to be one or higher for this to work and that means you have to use an immersion media typically oil but you could have water now also the same holds true for the 60 and the 100. in my lab the 60x has the equal numerical aperture to the 100. the only thing the 100 offers is a smaller field of view so we typically use a 60 because it has a 1.4 numerical aperture it has that high performance but it gives us a wider field of view and for our purposes that's more reasonable that's so going to be a little more efficient. That'll be a little more efficient too if you can use the 16 instead of the 100 to move around. Yeah. But but don't don't be tempted to go down lower for that efficiency because you will lose uh, that high numerical aperture, which is going to give you the many focal planes which is needed for this. Uh, let's see. So yeah, Nate, uh, uh, with the space balls probe, uh, here's another question. Uh, also, do we need a hundred times lens or can counting be done with 40 times? Okay, so let's go to back to stereology.info and take a look for those who maybe aren't familiar with space balls. Again, we use systematic random sampling um, both on the section level. So if you have a hundred sections, you might use an interval of 10 with a random start to, to, to have 10 sections. And then you might, uh, on uh, an average section, figure out spacing so that maybe 10 space balls would show up. This way you're gonna have something like um, uh, one or 200 space balls through your whole region and a couple intersections per space ball. Uh, let me show you what I mean by intersection. So here, region, uh, we're looking at space balls, region, so this is to estimate length, and rather than having a cube or rectangle at the site, uh, we have a sphere. Systematic random sampling, focusing up and down in thick tissue through this sphere. Our job is to mark where the blood vessels or the axons uh, go through this plane. Um, the surface area of the sphere is known uh the volume that the sphere circumscribes is known uh how many marks uh that we put down is recorded and here's the formula the length equals twice the number of intersections you count in all the sections for all the space balls times the volume of a cube that would fit around the space ball divided by the surface area of the space ball. So, so these, um, I always like to check formulas on a gut level, and it does make sense that the more intersections you get of the, of the isotropic virtual sphere, the space ball with the blood vessels or the strings, the more intersections you get, the more length there is. That's why this is up in the numerator. This is the surface area of the space ball. 
the bigger the space ball surface is given the same amount of hits, the less length is there. This is the reciprocal of the section subfraction. If you're skipping every 10th section, you need to multiply by, by 10. So I explain all that to answer the question. And the question is no, uh, the answer is no, you don't have to go to times 100. You don't have, have to use an oil lens uh, in order to see whether a biological string goes through a virtual sphere or not. Uh, you should figure it out empirically, try 10 times, see if you can tell when. So when you're focusing up and down through the sphere, you're gonna see a circle. See if at 10 times you can tell whether the fibers or the blood vessels are going through that circle. If it's too cramped, go up to 20 times uh, and use the lowest power you can where you can definitely see clearly whether the, um, whether the biological string is going through the probe or not. Uh, so yeah, and thank you for that question. You thick enough tissue to be able to practically achieve this. Just like optical fractionator or isotropic Lecaire, space balls also needs thick enough sections so that the sphere itself can fit in there. Um, if you don't have such thick sections, you can use a hemisphere. Uh, but you really, if you're going to use thin sections, uh, let's see, we can go to what are you estimating? and look at length. So when you're talking about length or surface and we're using, for instance, using a plane to probe for length, uh, this, you have to think about the orientation of the plane to the strings. Uh, notice that we get, oops, Play. There we go. No, so if your um, plane that you're using for a probe is perpendicular to the blood vessels or the axons, you're going to get a lot of hits. If the plane that you're using uh, to probe is parallel to the strings that you're trying to get the length of, you're not going to get any hits to go into the formula. So that is why instead of using a plane, try to use a sphere. Uh, but in order to use a sphere, you need thick sections, something like 30 microns thick. If you're stuck and you can't get thick sections, uh, people working in lung face this sometimes, people doing EM face this, where they have to use uh, thin sections, you can use the image plane itself as the probe and count the intersections of the blood vessels or the axons with the image plane. But in order to assure isotropy, you have to take your tissue chunk and roll it along the lab bench uh, as if it were a beach ball with three degrees of freedom. That's to uh, make sure that you don't always get this situation or you don't always get this situation. That's the problem with a thin section when you're doing length or surface. You have to take your tissue and make it isotropic. So to avoid the, prob the trouble of making your tissue isotropic, which anatomists hate because they can't read the tissue anymore, uh, use thick sections and use a probe, which is itself um, isotropic. Hey Dan, I hate to uh, jump in, but it does look like we're coming up on an hour. Um, so okay. I, I wanted to, uh, if we could hop back over to the PowerPoint to wrap yeah. up. Um, yeah, uh, keep in mind you can go to stereology.info to learn about how to do these probes. You can contact us. We will teach you how to do these probes, including all the things we talked about, uh, what to watch out for. Um, so I just want to thank everybody that joined us today. Um, we really appreciate it. We appreciate this opportunity to chat with you and answer some questions. Um, SFN is, is my absolute favorite time of year. Um, and everybody at MBF really loves meeting everybody in person, hearing about the, the great research that everyone's doing. Um, it's a privilege to work with, with each of you and, and just be a small part of the incredible work that you're all doing. Um, I was really disappointed that, that we couldn't go to SFN this past fall, um, obviously with good reason, um, but I was so glad to hear that, that the society was, was gonna have this virtual event just so we could kind of 
have something to to get us by um, until hopefully this this coming fall. Um, so so thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, it's it's really something that, that we treasure to to have this relationship with with our users. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Dan Peterson for his um, expertise and for for uh, lending a hand today uh, in providing his input. It's great to get that perspective from from a lab from the field. So thank you so much. Um, and, sure. and Dan Peruzzi, as always, um, great job. Thank you so much for for all your expertise. And we've got the song Sherpa in the background coordinating everything. I just want to run through uh, uh, the links here. Um, if you have any more questions or would like information, please email us, info at MBF Bioscience. We also have a, a forum that we've created in the last year. Um, so if you have additional questions, uh, much like the ones posed here today, please uh, post those. And uh, we're monitoring monitoring the forum. And uh, um, so thank you again, everybody. And uh, be well, stay healthy, and we'll see you soon.